Hi, everyone. Welcome and good evening. My name is Laura Nartilles, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science and the Harvard Library, I'm honored to introduce this virtual event with Elizabeth Colbert, presenting her new book, Under a White Sky, The Nature of the Future, in conversation with Amy Brady and featuring an introduction by Jerry Mitrovica. I hope you're all well and safe and hanging in there. Thank you so much for joining us virtually tonight. Tonight's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. To learn more about our other upcoming virtual events in the series, you can visit harvard.com and sign up for our email newsletter or check out the page harvard.com backslash science for more info. We also have a Science Research Public Lectures YouTube channel where you can view previous talks that you might have missed. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. So if you have a question for our authors at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase Under a White Sky on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you so much. Thank you to our partners at Harvard University and thank you to all of you for showing up and tuning in in support of authors, publishers, indie book selling, and especially for science because it really, really matters in this difficult time and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings over this past year, technical issues may arise. So if they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And now I am delighted to turn things over to our special guest, Jerry X. Mitrovica, theoretical geophysicist and Frank B. Baird, Jr. Professor of Science at Harvard University, who will introduce our speakers. Professor Mitrovica, the digital podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a good treat of mine to be asked to introduce Elizabeth Colbert and Amy Brady today. That's not something I'm not often asked to introduce two well-known writers. So. Um, it's great to be doing it. My research at Harvard focuses on sea level and sea level changes. And one of the things I often tell my students is that to understand what's anomalous, you really have to understand what is natural. And that brings to mind, at least to me, Elizabeth's book that most of us are familiar with, her Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Sixth Extinction, which I think I think of it as a, a discussion of the unnatural history of the Anthropocene. I once described the book to a uh, colleague as an observation of the impact of the meddling of humans in Darwin's world of natural selection. I'm not sure Elizabeth would agree. She's also, of course, very well known as a staff writer for The New Yorker, that magazine that makes us all feel guilty that we can't get through the whole thing every week when we receive it. Um, today's discussion is going to center on her new book, Under a White Sky, The Nature of the Future, which I think of as a bit of a sequel to The Sixth Extinction. The first described the impact of humans in driving extinctions, perhaps uh, even our own. This book discusses efforts by scientists and others to cure, uh, to cure what we have wrought, or, or as scientists would say, to mitigate climate change. Amongst other things in this book, uh, Elizabeth talks about one of my colleagues, Frank Koich. I don't know if Frank is on here somewhere, whether he's listening in. I hope he isn't, because I'll admit that with my students, I often call Frank the mad scientist in the department. I imagine him sitting there. One of his ideas, as Elizabeth talks about, is one way to cool climate is to send up nano diamonds, very small man-made diamonds up into the stratosphere where they reflect light and um, and cool the earth. But I'm a bit skeptical of those sorts of plans. And I think Elizabeth shares my skepticism. At least I get that sense from reading her book. I'm Canadian, but I was born in Australia. And if there's ever been a poster child for the unintended consequences of human meddling, I think it's Australia. Now, Elizabeth's book and all of her other writing, and I've read several other pieces by her, um, also bring home a message that I think is missing on the public. Climate can change very quickly, but what we've done to climate will not change quickly in any natural sense. The fact is the CO2 that we're now reach 400 parts per million, if we were to leave it to its own devices and stop emitting any further CO2 into the atmosphere, it would take thousands of years to get those levels 
down. And, and that's a message that is sort of the subtext of much of uh, what Elizabeth's writing talks about. She's going to be in conversation today uh, with Amy Brady. Amy is the deputy publisher of Guernica, which uh, I guess brings to mind another human catastrophe, doesn't it, Amy? Uh, she writes extensively. I was just chatting with her on the interface between art, literature, climate, social change, things like that. And I have actually read some of her pieces as we were discussing just before uh, we started here. I've read her pieces in McSweeney's, but she's published in a lot of other um, magazines and journals. Okay, so I'll now turn it over to uh, Elizabeth and Amy. I welcome you to Harvard Bookstore, Harvard University. And I think we're all looking forward to hearing your conversation. Elizabeth, Amy. Thank you, Jerry, and thank you, Harvard Bookstore, for this incredible event this evening. I am so thrilled to be speaking with the great Elizabeth Colbert, um, and also just a, a big thank you to everyone who is tuning in this evening to talk about Elizabeth's amazing new book, Under a White Sky, and of course, the crucial and critical subjects that she addresses in this book. Um, Elizabeth, thank you for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to speak with us tonight. Oh, well, thank everyone. Thanks, Jerry, for that intro. Thanks, Lauren, and thank you, Amy, for being here this evening. I really appreciate it. And thanks, everyone who's in the, in the invisible audience out there. <laughs> Well, I am very excited to talk to you about your new book, um, but would you like to read a short selection of it first for us? Sure. I'm just going to read um, a passage that's sort of near the near the beginning of the book comes right after um, a trip, I guess a little context, a trip that I take down the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal um, to a set of uh, electric barriers on this sort of weird fake uh, river. Okay. That man should have dominion over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth is a prophecy that is hardened into fact. Choose just about any metric you want and it tells the same story. People have by now directly transformed more than half the ice-free land on earth, some 27 million square miles, and indirectly half of what remains. We have dammed or diverted most of the world's major rivers. Our fertilizer plants and legume crops fix more nitrogen than all terrestrial ecosystems combined. And our planes, cars, and power stations emit about 100 times more carbon dioxide than volcanoes do. We now routinely cause earthquakes, a particularly damaging human-induced quake that shook Pawnee, Oklahoma on the morning of September 3rd, 2016, was felt all the way in Des Moines. In terms of sheer biomass, the numbers are stark staring. Today, people outweigh wild mammals by a ratio of more than eight to one. Add in the weight of our domesticated animals, mostly cows and pigs, and that ratio climbs to 22 to one. In fact, as a recent paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences observed, humans and livestock outweigh all vertebrates combined with the exception of fish. We have become the major driver of extinction and also probably of speciation. So pervasive is man's impact, it is said we live in a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene. In the age of man, there is nowhere to go, and this includes the deepest trenches of the oceans and the middle of the Antarctic ice sheet that does not already bear our Friday-like footprints. An obvious lesson to draw from this turn of events is be careful what you wish for. Atmospheric warming, ocean warming, ocean acidification, sea level rise, deglaciation, desertification, eutrophication. These are just some of the byproducts of our species success. Such as the pace of what is blandly labeled global change that there are only a handful of comparable examples in Earth's history. The most recent being the asteroid impact that ended the reign of the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. Humans are producing no analog climates, no analog ecosystems, a whole no analog future. At this point, it might be prudent to scale back our commitments and reduce our impacts, but there are so many of us, as of this writing, nearly 8 billion, and we are stepped in so far, return seems impracticable. And so we face a no analog predicament. If there is to be an answer to the problem of control, it's going to be more control. 
Only now it's to be got to be managed is not a nature that exists or is imagined to exist apart from the human. Instead, the new effort begins with a planet remade and spirals back on itself, not so much the control of nature as the control of the control of nature. First you reverse a river, then you electrify it. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. So in that section that you read, you start to get to the heart of some of the um, bigger themes in your book, uh, a book that takes you to places all around the world where you meet with scientists, engineers, and other experts who are trying to find man-made solutions to man-made problems. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what all of these different projects and experiments you visited have in common? Well, they all share the, the, the sort of theme, the, the, which is sort of summed up in, the, in the, that line, you know, first you reverse a river, then you electrify it, is they, they all share that there's some kind of human intervention. In some cases, it's, it's quite conscious. Um, we, we did something just to try to solve a problem. Um, and in some cases it was unwitting. We burned a lot of fossil fuels and you know, completely changed the climate. Um, and now we are confronting the, the impacts of that, of our own actions and trying to figure out ways to, to intercede again in, in the natural world or this world that is you know, part natural, part human. I, one of the terms that comes up in the book a couple of times is a coupled human and natural system, which is a real thing um, in, in academic discourse. And I think is, a, is an awkward term, but, but actually gets at something very important. They're not natural systems anymore and they're not human systems. They're this weird hybrid. Yeah, so um, in all of your research that you've done for this book, um, you talk with, uh, these experts who are looking at quote unquote unnatural solutions to which are basically unnatural problems since you know humans caused them and these experiments these projects they're functioning at kind of a larger planetary you know climate change uh, scale there are also some at the more regional ecological imbalance scale and then there are more of these hyper localized conservation projects that you also explore I hope we can talk about all of them <laughs> or at least most of them today um, but I would love to start uh, with the chapter from where your book gets its name, Under a White Sky, which addresses the issue of climate change. Um, you speak with experts who are very curious about solar geoengineering as a possible solution or a partial solution to global warming. Um, for folks who have yet to read your book, what is solar geoengineering and where is it in its development? Well, it's, it's sort of an appropriate thing to be talking about at the Harvard Bookstore because um, in, in the course of writing the book, I spent um, some time with the researchers at, at Harvard Solar Geoengineering Research Program, which is one of the you know, premier ge ge solar geoengineering pr programs in the country, probably the, the premier, and uh, maybe in the world, probably in the world. Um, and the idea behind solar geoengineering is, is pretty simple. And that is that we have, you know, very radically transformed the atmosphere just by dumping a lot of carbon dioxide into it. Uh, that was an unwitting uh, intervention. It's having consequences that we, um, don't care for, as as uh, Jerry pointed out, you know, it's not something that you can do anything about very quickly because of the long life of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And so, if you got get to a point where you have a climate you really don't don't like, and unfortunately, we we may be heading there. Uh, what 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 can you do on sort of a human lifetime timescale? One of the few ideas that that people have come up with is you could then, you know, we've, we've intervened in the atmosphere one way, you could intervene in a new way, the opposite way, you would uh, spread uh, some kind of reflective particle in the stratosphere, which where um, it would sort of drift around, create this sort of stratospheric haze. Uh, and 
that would just bounce sunlight back to earth. It, these reflective particles would just bounce sunlight back to earth, so back to the space, I'm sorry, so, so that less direct sunlight would be hitting the earth and that would have a cooling effect. And, and we know that this is, um, this is what happens because it's what, ha what's happen what happens after a major volcanic eruption. You get a lot of sulfur dioxide uh, that gets spewed into the air. If the um, volcano is powerful enough, it gets you know, ejected into the stratosphere and drifts around the world. And for an appreciable amount of time, several months to years, you get this cooling effect, which you know, was measured, for example, after Mount Pinatubo. Mm -hmm. Now, it's fair to say, right, that this is a pretty controversial uh, idea. I think that's fair. I think, <laughs> I think that's more than fair. Yeah, no, very, very, very controversial. And um, because, you know, we would be uh, taking control in, in a sense of, of, the, of the whole climate system or trying to, um, and there, you know, the impacts, the potential side effects of this are, are quite serious. Um, and one of them, one of the less serious ones actually, and that gets back to the title of the book, is that it could change the appearance of the sky. There have been studies that suggest that it would, um, if, if you went out to a place where now you'd expect to see a very blue sky on a very clear day, you, the sky would sort of have a would look like it does in, in, in New York in an urban area. Um, it would have a sort of milky tinge. So that's where the title comes from, Under a White Sky. Yeah. Um, are there scientists though that are pushing to make solar geoengineering a reality even in our lifetime? Well, I, I think that I would characterize what, what people are, what some scientists are pushing for is we should know whether this would even work or not. We should do research on it. We should find out, you know, it, it exists on paper. The idea exists on paper, um, but both the question of whether, you know, it, it will in fact work and also what are the side effects? You can't really, you know, you can do a lot of modeling on computers and that a lot of modeling has been done, um, but until you do some real work, uh, you can't really know how these particles behave in the stratosphere. You know, we, we, for example, you know, sulfur dioxide you do get in the stratosphere if you have a major volcanic eruption, but if you were to use another compound, um, for example, calcium carbonate is something that has been suggested, it's not up in the stratosphere. So unless you, unless you put it there, you don't really know how it behaves. And so I think the argument is not for doing it, but the argument is for researching it. Mm. And, and some people are adamantly opposed to even researching it. You know, it's sort of the old classic, uh, you know, camel's nose under the tent. That's what some opponents of even researching it would say. Oh, interesting. Well, speaking of um, controversial experiments and potentially terrifying outcomes, um, I want to talk to you about your chapter on gene editing. Uh, this was another one of those chapters where um, you know, I just kind of read it with my jaw on the floor that, uh, first off, that human beings even have the capabilities that we do. Um, uh, but then also that, you know, there are some folks that are seriously considering employing these technologies to further interfere with the earth. Um, so uh, in your chapter, you talk about how a type of gene editing uh, could be intentionally used to reduce the population of uh, invasive species or overpopulated species that have contributed to further ecological imbalance. Um, how, how are they thinking, how are scientists thinking about using this kind of gene editing tool? Well, the, the gene editing tool um, sort of in question, there, there's sort of two steps to it has that. And all of these, there's been tremendous advances in gene editing over the last, just in the last decade. And two scientists just won the Nobel Prize for, um, for this sort of suite of techniques that's called, just usually called CRISPR, just under the you know, acronym CRISPR. And what CRISPR is, is, and I'm sure you know, many of the people out there in the audience tonight know this better than I do, but it's just a, a bacteria use, use CRISPR, use this system for identifying 
their enemies, viral enemies. Uh, they basically incorporate little snapshots of their viral enemies into their own genome. And then when they encounter them, they can send out these enzymes that cut them, these, their, their, the DNA or the RNA of their, of their enemies very, very precisely. And that has been um, harnessed now by scientists who have just figured out how to direct these enzymes to where they want to make a cut in an organism's genome. And you can either use that to disable a gene or you can use it to replace it with another gene. You can even use it to replace it with a gene from another species or a totally synthetic DNA sequence. So it's an incredibly powerful tool. And it also has the ability because it itself is encoded, this whole system is encoded in, in DNA, it can be inserted into an organism so that the organism will reprogram its own genes, which is where you get this incredible power. And that is this idea of what's called a gene drive. And gene drive is I can make a change in an organism that the organism will now pass down to all of its offspring. So one idea that's out there, you know, invasive species are a terrible problem. Um, and there's you know, controversy over this too, whether you know, things that are in the wrong place, not where they you know, evolved, should they, should they be called invaders? Is that sort of um, you know, bringing human values to things? But I think it's fair to say they are a major driver of extinction, um, especially on islands. They've just been responsible for hundreds of extinctions. And so one of the questions is, could you use gene drive to basically insert some kind of trait that's very maladaptive, something that interferes with reproduction that will then get passed down and eliminate a population. I don't think anyone would want to eliminate a whole species, but could you craft this so carefully that you could eliminate, for example, rats on an island? And I was in Australia. There's a lot of work going on in Australia um, because as Jerry pointed out, that's a very, uh, very, very manipulated um, ecosystem, a unique fauna um, that's been devastated by invasive species. So there's a lot of work going on there. And the folks I visited, one group was trying to figure out, could you do a gene drive rodent that would uh, eliminate a, a whole population? Mm. Uh, I mean, it just seems like it, if one tiny, tiny little thing went wrong, um, I mean, we could eliminate mice in the world. <laughs> yes, it's a very, it's a very, uh, uh, you know, um, maybe second only, or maybe not even second only to geoengineering as a potentially, um, a, a, a potential solution that can be a potential disaster. And, you know, certainly the people working on it, you know, when I visited people who are working on it, they're working in very biosecure facilities, you know, they're, first of all, they were having trouble getting, getting the gene drive to work in the mouse, but eventually it will work. I think that's, that's probably pretty clear. And um, then the question of whether, you know, you should let this creature out into the world is going to be a very, very big question. And, you know, there are all sorts of ideas out there for how you might limit this, you know, it would exhaust itself after a certain amount of time or generationally, or it would be uh, very carefully tied to a gene variant that only exists in this population, you know, that sort of thing. But these are, these are very difficult um, technical problems. So I don't know, you know, when we're going to actually, when or if those are ever going to be solved. Mm. Mm. Um. I, I want to just pause for just a moment to um, remind some folks that at the end of my Q&A with Elizabeth, we will be taking questions from uh, attendees. So in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, go ahead and drop your questions in there. I saw that we already have some really great ones coming in. So just wanna remind everybody of that. Um, well, thank you, Elizabeth, for, for that summary. Uh, like I said, that chapter was just, um, <laughs> amazing to me for so many different reasons. Um, I, I want to talk about uh, another uh, project that you visited, one that um, 
I found, I thought it was a little less terrifying, <laughs> a little more uplifting, um, but still uh, definitely had these edges of despair to it because the reason it exists is because of what humans have done to the planet. And uh, it's the coral project that you visited in Hawaii. Um, on in Hawaii, there are scientists who are intentionally raising baby coral under uh, distress or under stress. Why are they doing this? Well, this is really the, the story that got me sort of going on this this whole project that became a book. I went out um, several years ago, maybe four years ago, to Hawaii to the Marine Biological Station um, on Oahu and. They're um, a very, very dynamic marine uh, biologist by the name of, of Ruth Gates had, had come up with this project idea. Um, and once again, it started with this idea that, you know, well, humans have mucked around with the oceans. We've really changed the oceans really profoundly. That's partly climate change, um, which is, you know, warming the oceans very fast uh, on a sort of geological scale. And then also, a lot of the CO2 that we pour into the oceans ends up really quickly in the surface waters of the, of, I mean, that we pour into the air ends up in the, being dissolved in the oceans and that's changing the chemistry of the oceans. And one group of organisms that we know does not like this, we can already see uh, is, is, is corals, reef building corals, these tiny, tiny little gelatinous creatures that build coral reefs. Um, so Ruth's idea was, well, we're not getting the ocean of the past back any time in any foreseeable time frame, And if we want reefs, if we want in the year 2100, if we want there to still be coral reefs, we're gonna to have to manipulate reefs too. And so her, so the idea here was, could we raise in some way corals? And it, it does start to inch towards genetic engineering. Um, could we sort of breed them up to be hardier cross different species maybe, or cross uh, corals from different parts of the reef um, and you know subject them to stress and see how they do and the hardiest ones the very hardiest ones we could try to use to repopulate parts of the reef that in Hawaii or on the Great Barrier Reef that have already been um, you know decimated by by warming um, they were they're also manipulating trying to work with the symbionts corals reef building corals have a very interesting relationship with these plant symbionts uh, could you find hardy or symbionts? I, they were looking at all parts of this ecosystem. Um, and then, you know, then that raises the question, okay, even if you could do that, and, you know, there's questions obviously about that, that sort of pushes you towards gene editing because it's very hard to produce kind of enough of them unless you sort of start pushing these traits out into the population. So that's something I think that is just over the horizon. Yeah. Well, I have to say of all the chapters in your book, all of them made me think <laughs> in ways in, about the natural world and, you know, humanity's relationship to it in ways that I'd never thought before. But it was this chapter in particular that really challenged some of my previously held opinions on whether humans should even interfere anymore. And so I would just love to hear your experience with that. I mean, did did it change how you think about um, the ethics of our relationship with the world? Well, it definitely, I mean, I do think there's a, you know, there, there's sort of the knee, knee jerk, I guess I'll call it reaction, which, you know, people like, like me have, you know, being sort of a old style environmentalist, you know, well, let's just, let's just keep hands off, you know, and I think one of the one of the messages that, that Ruth Gates, with who, who, who very, very, very sadly passed away about two years after I spent a week or so with her in Hawaii, but she was a very dynamic person, a very smart person. And her point was, look, we are, you know, you may, you may sit there and think I, I just want it all to go back. If we just leave it alone, it will go back, but it, it's not going back. It's only, you know, the oceans are only getting warmer. I mean, that's the thing we can kind of guarantee for the foreseeable future. Um, so do you, you know, do you want reefs? It's, it's, you can jump up and down and say, well, we really need to stop emitting carbon, which is absolutely true, but you're still not getting the reefs of the past back. So what are you gonna do? And I think that 
as you're suggesting, it raises really profound questions. You know, there may not be anything, you know, practical as it were that you can do, but it's also, I don't think necessarily acceptable to just say, you know, hands off at this point. Um, so all of the, everything, you know, only, there are only really difficult decisions here. There's no, there's no clear right answer. Yeah, um, I have a quote, it was from, I, I think Ruth Gates, who you quote in your book, who said, our project, the Coral Project, our project is acknowledging that a future is coming where nature is no longer fully natural. And that's kind of where it clicked for me. Yeah, yeah. No, she made a, she made a really big impression on me too. And that whole project, which I think, you know, was also controversial in the sense of, you know, some people thought it was um, pie in the sky, really. Um, you know, she she did make me think about this this whole issue of intervening to you know to counter an intervention. And once I started to see once. I started to think that way. I just sort of started to see it in a lot of different things that we're doing. Yeah. Or thinking yeah. about doing as that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that, it, I mean, yeah, that, that theme is certainly just through your entire book. Um, and speaking of other things that are through your entire book, I, I want to talk about the tone of your book because like you, I'm sure like so many people on uh, who are viewing this tonight, um, we read a lot about climate change, environmental degradation and what have you. And the tone is always very negative. It's fearful, it's despairing, it's sad. And you know, there certainly are elements of that in your book um, for all the reasons we just discussed. Um, but your book is often very funny. I mean, there's this kind of this wry humor in it. Oh, I mean, it's it's uh, it's clear throughout the book. Um, so just, you know, speaking as a, a journalist, um, you know, a writer who is clearly thinks, you know, uh, uh, very deeply about her craft, you know, how did you decide to arrive at this balance between the negative and this more kind of, you know, uh, uh, amusing tone that you strike? Well, I, I was really trying to, um, you know, get people to think about the I, things. Things there's, there's there are so many polemics out there, and I'm not really, I'm not opposed to polemics. I, I like a good polemic as much as the next person, you know. But I do think that people eventually turn away and they just don't want to hear it. And so I, I, I guess in a way, you know, partly. Partly this stuff is funny. I mean, some of it is funny. You know, there's a chapter, the genetic engineering chapter, you know, a lot of it's about cane toads, which are um, intrinsically rather comical. They're incredibly destructive. You know, they were brought to Australia uh, and have just overrun the countryside. And there's a great movie called, I think it's it's a cult classic in, in Australia. I recommend it. You can find it on the, on the web. It's just, I think it's just called the cane toad. A natural an unnatural history or something like that. Anyway, um, a lot of a lot of these stories do just have a naturally dark comic element to them. You know, I mean, it's like the you know the sorcerer's apprentice sort of. Um, but so part of it was just the nature of the material, and part of it was sort of a more conscious decision um, to try try something different. You know, try my own tastes run towards you know, dark comedy. So, um, you know, you, maybe you sort of write what you, what you like, or you try to write what you like as that. Yeah. 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 Well, the, the tone is definitely, um, one of my favorite things about this book. Um, it's just, it was, it was just a pleasure to read. Um, well, I want to make sure we leave plenty of time. Was, and we have a lot of questions coming in. So I'm just going to ask you one more question before we turn to the audience. Um, it's probably one that as an environmentalist and a writer, you're probably sick of hearing, but I admit it's what I wrestle with myself. So I just am going to ask you, and that's that, you know, after everything that you've researched and you've learned, and of course you already knew, about climate change, the ecological problems we have, the related humanitarian crises. Are you optimistic for the future? <laughs> well, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer that um, 
I'm going to answer that with a, that question with a little bit of a story, which was um, several years ago, Steven Soderbergh, the um, Hollywood director, gave a speech. It was supposed to be sort of his valedictory to Hollywood, but I don't think it was. He went on to make other movies. but um, And it was also supposed to be private, but of course it was immediately published everywhere. And at the end of it, he said that he he was very down on Hollywood and, and the whole ethos of the place. And he was giving advice to young filmmakers. And he said, here's my tip. And you go in there, you're pitching a movie. Um, it doesn't matter what it's about. It could be about genocide. You know, it could be about child abuse. Pretend you're having an epiphany and just sort of look up and say, you know what? In the end, this is really a movie about hope. And that uh, I think is kind of a hilarious, you know, just his hilarious jab at Hollywood. Um, but I think it speaks to something pretty profound, which is that as Americans, you know, we're we're very hope we're very hopeful. We're we're a very optimistic people, or at least we were as that until recently. Um, and maybe we were trained by Hollywood that way. Um, but we also are very. Uh, you know, thoughtless uh, as a, as a nation, we are you know responsible for uh, more CO two that's up in the atmosphere than any other country. You know, with with four percent or five percent of the world's population, we're responsible for something like thirty percent of all emissions. So I don't think you know hope and acting properly don't necessarily go hand in hand. And I think the issue is less whether we're hopeful, how we feel about what we're doing, than what we are doing. And so. That is, you know, that's the sort of non my non-answer answer. How's that? Well, it's a catalyzing answer. It's it's inspiring, and um, you know, I, I hope everyone is by that answer is moved to do what we can do in our own individual roles um, in the world. So, um, well, thank you, Elizabeth. This has been so much fun, um, but we have a lot more questions for you because we have so many. Uh, enthused folks tuning in tonight. So um, let's see here. Our first question for you uh, comes from Camden. And Camden wants to know, what are the risks to natural change uh, as we pursue restoring and maintaining balance through scientific and uh, engineering solutions to mitigating climate change? Um, you know, in, in other words, how do we decide how much change is acceptable? Well, that's that's a very good question. And I mean, you know, many, many people who are much better uh, versed in this than I have sort of, you know, come up with this, you know, these thresholds that we don't want to cross. One of them is, you know, we don't want to go above an average global temperature increase of 1.5 degrees. We're, we're pretty much up against that right now. So we are going to cross that. I don't think that's a very controversial statement that I'm saying then. Um, the next sort of threshold is, okay, well, let's not cross two degrees. Now, that's going to be very, very tough. Um, maybe we will be able to do that. But I, I do think, I'm not sure exactly what the, what, what sort of natural change um, you're driving at here. But one, one point that I will make that I hope addresses some of it is, there are a lot of things that we could potentially do to try to mitigate climate change. That will have you know tremendous land use uh, implications. You know, if we decided, for example, even even something that sounds as benign as as you know forestation, a reforestation, or or creating new forests. You know, if you build, if you plant, you know, fast growing trees because you want them to suck up a lot of carbon, that's not necessarily, uh, you know, that's that that. It's not a real forest. Um, it's not necessarily what was there. It's not necessarily good for you know a lot of creatures. So you know whatever we do, unfortunately, um, is is going to have uh, implications for other species. That uh, I would I would say we will have to weigh, but the fact is we won't weigh it. We'll, we'll just sort of do it if we think. Uh, that it's in our best interests, but it won't necessarily uh, it won't necessarily reduce extinction rates. It could po quite possibly aggravate them. So, so there are a lot of big issues, you know, out there. Yeah. 
Um, well, I, I have a great question here from, uh, from Heather, who uh, says that, you know, it occurs to her that if we want to confront the root cause of climate change, we'd be more successful if we stopped trying to treat its symptoms and started trying to change ourselves. And so her question for you is, if you had it in your power to alter one thing about human behavior, what would it be? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, obviously what I shouldn't say obviously, but what, you know, what's gotten us to where we are is this is our is our great um, capacity for, you know, for consumption. Um, so I suppose I would make us all uh, a lot more inconvenience, consumption and convenience, I suppose I'd make us a lot more um, a lot less interested in that and we would all uh do nothing but read books maybe or something like that although even books people will point out require paper so um but but they're relatively benign compared to a lot of other forms of consumption so we we need to really um yeah i completely agree we need to change pretty dramatically what we consider to be a good life um and until until and unless we do that I think we are sort of fighting an uphill battle because our our impacts are just so huge. That's sort of the point of the book. They're just so huge. They're everywhere, uh, and it's very difficult to dial that back. And for everyone, eight billion people on the planet, to survive, you know, that there's just there's just a lot of pressures on the natural world. And so, the, especially those of us in 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 richer parts of the world need to really. Uh, be willing to scale back. Now, is that going to happen? You asked me before if I was, you know, optimistic. I'm not wildly optimistic about that. How's that? Mm. Um, here is another question about, um, oh, this one isn't so much about whether we will do these projects, but who will have final say? Um, this is uh, an anonymous attendee who says, <laughs> Who, who do you envision will have the final say on whether or not scientists move forward with any of these projects? Does public opinion matter? Well, that, that is a good question. And I mean, the book really starts with um, projects that are pretty local or regional and some of which exist. I mean, they exist. You know, you go down the Chicago River, Chicago River was reversed uh, about a century ago to, um, alleviate Chicago's sewage problems and now that created other problems so now you know the river's been electrified that that is something you can already visit and see and that in fact was done in response to public opinion I think there there was a lot of public concern about species that were crossing uh, from the Great Lakes to the Mississippi River um, you know as we move up the scale um, you know to something like you know the ultimate question of this I suppose is solar geoengineering and there are groups of people looking at you know what solar geoengineering governance would look like um, but you know there's no mechanism right now in which the whole world could sort of be polled and decide you know what what do you think of this um, and the inability of getting the whole world you know on the same page is one of the reasons we keep having you know climate negotiations every year and not uh, making a tremendous amount of progress. So, you know, it, these are not non-unique problems. You know, we don't have a lot of good ways for people to have input on a lot of the great questions of our time. Um, this, this is just a new sort of new set of questions that you have to ask those questions about. And I, I think it's a, a crucial question and I don't think anyone has the answer for it. Yeah. Well, um, I have a question here from John, who um, is seeking a kind of answer to what we might be able to do. Um, John asks, uh, since attempting to solve so many problems has only created more problems, how are we, um, kind of the global we, I guess, or maybe specific Boston we, <laughs> um, how are we as potential investors, voters, citizens, supposed to evaluate the potential of emerging climate solutions um i don't know is there like a metric is there a a resource what, what do you think how do we know whether 
we should be supporting these things? Well, that's that's another really good question. I mean, I think that um, you know there are certain broad brush uh, principles. I guess you could try to apply. Um, you know, does it you know does it bring down emissions? Okay, that you know good. <laughs> does it do so in a way that impacts people or or, or other creatures? You know so seriously that it maybe isn't worth it. You know, I don't know that there are too many ideas out there on the table now that I would say, okay, well, that's just not even worth it. You know, that's so bad. But, but we, you know, that's in part because we haven't made much progress. You know, we haven't taken very many serious steps. So um, I think that, I don't know if there's a, a principle that you can use, you're obviously gonna to have to find people. And there's, you know, there's gonna be knockdown, drag out fights, even if you cross the threshold to, okay, we all agree, we're all on the same page, we've really got to act. Uh, there's gonna be fights over everything. There's gonna be fights over citing all these projects. There's gonna be fights over, over land use, over you know, who, whose ox gets scored, as it were, over jobs. Um, and so I don't have, I wish I had like, you know, like those um, tables, you know, you bring to the store, like which fish are sustainable or whatever, and you can bring them to the fish counter and sort of say, is that fish, you know, how does it rank? I wish I had that for climate change, um, but I don't. But I do think that, you know, you people are gonna have to find groups of, of knowledgeable people whom they basically trust to, um, give them good advice because obviously every individual is not going to be able to say, oh, not going to be able to go research every possible project uh, on his or her own uh, and find out whether they support it or not. And to be honest, we're not going to be asked, you know, for our support or not support on a lot of projects. They're, they'll be fought out on, you know, state level, local level. Um, we have a question here from Jerry, who, um, is interested in electric vehicles. Um, Elizabeth, in your research, uh, did you learn anything about perhaps the negative environmental consequences to manufacturing electric vehicles? Well, I mean, electric vehicles have, um, I, I think they have, you know, one, the only one I know of is that they, they, they do require certain, um, elements, you know, for their production, like, you know, rare earth minerals and, and that that are hard to get at and that, you know, can be environmentally destructive to get at. Now, of course, all everything, getting at any kind of um, resource can be environmentally destructive. So, um, but in general, electric vehicles, I mean, the, the, the major or one of the simple major pluses of, of electric vehicles is they they simply turn more of the energy that you put into them into motion, you know. So they are immediately much more efficient than uh, gasoline-powered engines. And so even though they're, you know, maybe once again that may be one of these cases where there there you know there may be some some genuine serious um, effects that we don't like. You know, the overall effect I think. Once again, most experts that I trust, at least, I would say, would say, this is the way you've got to go. You know, you've got to get rid of as many vehicles as we can. We've got to electrify our vehicle fleet as much as possible because they're simply much more efficient. And it is possible also to decarbonize the electrical grid. It's possible. It is just not possible to decarbonize, you know, an internal combustion engine. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, we have a lot of questions coming in um, kind of uh, about the current political milieu. <laughs> um, uh, one, uh, I think we can kind of sum it up in, in this one really great question. Would you comment on how the new Biden administration is emphasizing environmental concerns, um, concern over our oceans, et cetera, et cetera? Well, I, I give the new administration, I, I did, I wrote sort of an editorial for the New Yorker a week or two ago about this. I, I give the new administration quite high marks. You know, they're, they've only had a couple weeks. Um, they, 
Biden has put together, I think, a very impressive team of people to think about, work on climate, think about climate, try to coordinate climate policy because, you know, one of the problems that we have is that you can't, you can't have some arrows going in one direction, some arrows going in the other direction. You have to have all of the arrows pointing in the same direction um, to get anything meaningful do done. And I think they really understand that. Um, and, you know, Gina McCarthy is in the administration, proud Bostonian. Um, and uh, I think, so I, I give them quite high marks for the first, you know, first set of moves they've made. Now, the question, obviously, you know, the, the proof is in the pudding. So one question will be how, what kind of follow through we get on, on these policies that are now in pa on paper. Um, you know, a whole slew of new regs are going to have to be written. You can't just, in many cases, you know, Trump reversed Obama era rules. You can't just, you know, go back. You have to rewrite them again. So there's, there's a huge amount of time consuming work that has to go into it. Um, and then, and then the real bottom line is that, you know, I think everyone who's really looked at this issue over time, the issue of climate change, at least, um, would say, well, we, it's really hard to do meaningful stuff without any congressional action where you keep having to do it via regulation, which is litigated and challenged in court. And we have a pretty anti-regulatory Supreme Court. Um, so, you know, we really need congressional action. And with such a narrowly divided Senate, are we going to get anything out of them or not? And I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Um, we have a, another theme in some of the questions tonight, um, and that one is on the uh, uh, rather unpopular subject of population control. Um, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. Why, why, uh, and to your mind, Elizabeth, why is the idea of population control so unpopular? Um, I mean, to the point where nobody uh, in the press even really wants to talk about it. Well, I mean, population con control, I suppose, has has become a really has become a very divisive political issue. And you know, there's a lot of history here that we we don't need to go into to now. But one of the fundamental is issues here is that you know, in a, in in a lot of the sort of developed world, the richer countries, population, you know, reproduction rates have dropped below what are called replacement rates, right? So population in the absence of immigration would be sinking and in some places is sinking, you know, you know Japan is gonna lose a lot of people uh, because it has such a low birth rate. So in, in, in high consuming parts of the world, birth rates are, have dropped and are dropping. Now in some low consuming parts of the world, birth rates are still quite high. So the question is, is it, is it sort of fair to, you know, what should we be looking at? The fact that, you know, people with low birth rates are consuming too much or the people with a high, you know, who are consuming very little have, have higher birth rates. And, and that's a pretty divisive issue. And you can understand why. And at, at the end of the day, you know, I, I think both both are important. It's, it, it's you know our impacts, human impacts, are a function of how many of us there are and how much each of us is consuming. And so, uh, I think we need to look at both parts of that equation. And one thing that I would also say is, you know, population control. Maybe that's the wrong word, but just trying to make sure, for example, that every woman in the world who wants access to birth control can get it. I think that's something that most Americans, you know, would, would agree. That's a good policy. We should be helping other countries, poorer countries, you know, helping women in poor countries get access to birth control. But that has been a terrible political football um, where, each, you know, the Trump administration cut off aid to a lot of organizations, any organization um, that also provided abortions, you know, couldn't get any, any aid. And so, you know, we are also, once again, we got to get our own act together here in the US and stop this four years on, four years off kind of support of access to birth control. And that would be a first step in the right direction. Great. Thank you for that. Um, we have uh, 
several people asking, it's so interesting the themes that have emerged tonight. Um, several people um, are coming back to the question of solar geoengineering, but they're asking specifically about the possibility and the worry perhaps folks like us should have um, about whether billionaires like Elon Musk are going <laughs> to, yeah. um, you know, start taking uh, solar engineering into their own hands. Is, is that a concern? Well, um, I very rarely, as you know, you know, try to ratchet down the level of concern, but that is one concern, one concern that I will try to put to bed because um, if you're really doing solar geoengineering on a, on a meaningful scale, you need a, a fleet of aircraft that can reach the stratosphere with a you know, pretty significant payload. You need to do it over and over and over again. And if you're a country like the US, you know, and you decide, and Elon Musk, even if he could develop this fleet of aircraft, which is possible, um, although I don't think you could do it secretly, um, and, and suddenly these planes started to fly every day and the US or China or Russia or some other great power decided, well, we don't really want Elon Musk doing this. Um, I don't think it would continue for very long. I mean, it's pretty easy to shoot one of those guys out of the sky. So I don't think the idea of the rogue billionaire uh, geoengineering the earth like out of some James Bond movie, that is one concern, um, maybe the only one uh, that I can uh, make people feel, you know, less worried about. But I, I, I rank that pretty low on my own list of worries. Great, thank you. Well, I, I personally take some comfort in that. <laughs> I think I, I share some of the concern with the folks uh, listening in tonight. Um, I see we're just about out at time, Elizabeth. So I'm just going to ask you one more question. Um, this comes from Michael, and he asks you. Uh, and, and apologies to everyone. There were so many questions; it was just not enough time to get to everyone. But um, Michael asks, "What or who do you have the most faith in?" Um, I'm assuming in terms of potential solutions to things like climate change. And uh, his second follow-up question to that is, and are we doing enough in the schools? Those are, those are, those are both really good questions. Well, one, one idea that I wanna you know, sort of put, put out there um, is this idea that another Harvard uh, scientist has put out there, which is um, Ed Wilson has, has a book uh, called Half Earth, which advocates putting aside basically half of the land and half of the waters of, of the world aside, you know, for other creatures. And these, these places would not, would still be subject, obviously, to climate change, they'd still be subject to these sort of big global forces that we've set in motion. But um, they would allow as many species as sort of possible space to, to evolve and adapt. And I think in terms of, uh, you know, ideas for how we could get as many species as possible, uh, non-human species, you know, through the next hundred years or so, that's a very powerful uh, argument. So I, I, I sort of would say I, I Ed Wilson is someone I, I really look up to and, um, I would take his advice over a lot of people's. Um, and, and Biden has, you know, there, you're gonna hear this 30, 30 by 30, by 2030 idea of 30% of the land in the US. And I, I don't know if we'll reach that and I don't know exactly even what he means by that, but it is out there in sort of in the zeitgeist and I think it has merit. And are we doing enough in the schools is a question that I have a hard time answering. Um, because I'm, I no longer have kids, you know, uh, little kids, um, and I'm not in the schools. But, you know, I strongly suspect that the answer is no. You know, nothing could be more important. No, no issues I don't think could be more important to the young people of this country than these issues, which are going to really dominate their futures. Um, but you know, of course, nowadays people aren't even going to school practically, so it's it's. What you know, but that's that's a whole other issue. We won't get into that. Um, but I think that developing curricula for kids um, around these issues is 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 really important and also really tough. I'm going to say it is tough because these are really really heavy 
numbers. Um, but that being said, you know, there's a lot of youth activism around climate change. And so maybe that is getting the attention um, of the educational, you know, the pedagogical community, which, which as, as I said, I'm not really part of. Yeah. No, that would be amazing. <laughs> Um, Elizabeth, thank you. This has been such a fun and enlightening conversation. Um, I believe there's a and thanks I believe everyone out there. <laughs> yes, thanks everyone for tuning in. And I believe there is a purchase link um, in the, the chat box. Yes, there is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you both so much for this fantastic conversation. And thank you to Jerry for that wonderful intro. Thank you to all of you out there for spending your evening with us and please learn more about this fascinating book and purchase Under a White Sky at harvard.com. Link is in the chat. Um, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science and the Harvard Library here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a good night, keep reading and stay warm. Thanks guys. Good night. Bye.